I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm happy to welcome you to this Global Leaders Series event focusing on the upcoming selection of the person who will become the next Secretary General of the United Nations. IPI is presenting all the official candidates for the post individually here in the Trigvi Lee Center, and our guest today is Miroslav Lychok, the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic, currently the President of the European Council, and former High Representative of the International Community and European Union Special Representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now you in the audience have his full biography in your papers, but for the sake of those of you who are following this via video, let me note briefly that in addition to the post I just mentioned, Mr. Lajcak has been Slovakia's Deputy Prime Minister and Ambassador, Managing Director for Europe and Central Asia in the Diplomatic Service of the EU, and the EU's Chief Negotiator for the Association Agreements with Ukraine and Moldova. His international engagements commenced in 1999 when he served as the executive assistant to the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Balkans, his fellow Slovakian, Eduard Kukan. As with the other candidates who have appeared here, we have asked him to speak for 15 minutes, and then we will go directly to the question and answer period with you. So please join me in welcoming to IPI the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic, Miroslav Lacek. So thank you for the introduction. Thank you all for coming, for having me for this conversation. As you know, this is not my first time here that I intend to speak about the United Nations, about multilateralism, and about why I so much believe in it. When I came here in February 2015, I laid out my vision of multilateralism in detail. I spoke about my understanding of the world we are living in. I touched upon the role of the United Nations in it and uh, its capacities and engagement. I mentioned challenges and crises, both regional and global. And I stressed prevention and mediation as the key instrument at our disposal. And I also briefly informed you about my professional experience and the lessons I learned throughout it. I'm here today as active foreign minister of my country in my third term, and I meet you also in the capacity of the current EU presidency that my country assumed 1st of July and will hold until the end of this year. But primarily, I stand here for the first time as an official candidate of Slovakia and the only candidate from Central Europe for the post of the United Nations Secretary General. It might have taken more time than expected to announce my candidature. I ultimately made up my mind based on encouragement that I received from both home and abroad. But what truly convinced me to run for this post was strong boost across the political spectrum in Slovakia. I got direct and unwavering support, not only from my government, but also from the president, from the speaker of the <coughs> parliament, and also from the general public, from NGOs, from journalists, and from experts. Now, I hate to speak about myself, but I believe it's an appropriate place to say a few words. So I was born in one system. I watched and actively helped with a unique transformation of a political, economic, and social reality into a completely new one. And now I'm directly involved in forming it to best serve the people. So I have lived in two systems. And I very well know how good or bad they are. And I fully understand, both as a citizen and a diplomat, what such enormous change means to people, to system, to power structures. This is my home experience. But I also serve the international community, twice under the UN mandate and three times on behalf of the European Union. I oversaw the peaceful separation of Serbia and Montenegro. Independent Montenegro 
became the first and only post-Yugoslav country born as a result of an EU-negotiated process and without violence. It went so smoothly, but nobody notices that in my, in, in my CV now. <laughs> Later, I was an international administrator of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is a unique crossroad of Islamic, Catholic and Orthodox cultures. These engagements helped me understand the world a lot. But it mostly gave me wisdom and skills that I try to keep ever since, all my professional life. What do I mean? There are some principles that I've learned and try to implement. Namely, deal with any problem with an open heart and good, intention, good intentions. Create trust. Keep it positive. Do it for something or someone, not against. Make friends, not enemies. Talk, maintain dialogue and compromise. Never shut the door. Treat partners according to their relevance, not your liking. Avoid labeling good or bad. Listen to all sides without favoring one or the other. <coughs> but also hear well and understand. Respect local environment its history, mentality, traditions. And be aware of the fact that no problem is universal. Opt for tailor-made solutions. There is no such thing as one size fits all. Dear friends, I have accepted my government's nomination with humility and respect. I'm a believer and longtime advocate of the United Nations as a cornerstone of effective multilateralism. I want to see this organization as effective, dynamic, and reliable. An organization nations respect and trust. The only organization able to make a real positive difference in people's lives globally. When serving under the UN flag, I learned firsthand how tough it was. This experience deepened my already great respect for the United Nations and for all who work for it. Be it peacekeepers, humanitarian officers, political agents, social workers. I got to understand that sustained peace would be unattainable without a well-functioning United Nations. So I want to contribute to its work, because I believe I can further deliver. I believe in the convincing power of the United Nations that brings everyone to the table. And the Secretary General, in my understanding, should be the con convincing power to build bridges and foster mutual understanding a communicator facilitating and mediating a consensus. Someone who comes up with an initiative and garners widest possible support for it. I also believe that no system can work unless we respect the rules. I prefer using existing tools, strengthened where, where necessary, for example, by tailor-made ad hoc mechanisms. I'm a realist fully aware of the mandate and the competencies of the Secretary General. The United Nations belong to its member states, and any change in its functioning is in their hands. Any substantial progress is a matter of collective political will. However, the Secretary General will have to ensure that the UN system is fully adapted to new agendas and challenges, and there are plenty. He or she will have to provide guidance in the work of the UN Secretariat and make sure that the whole UN system acts coherently and in an integrated manner. We need action on many issues of global significance. Generally speaking, we are satisfied with the UN's work. There are areas where it is strong and excellent, such as development. Yet, we need to do better at some fronts, to improve our efforts in the area of international <coughs> peace and security to strengthen the UN's ability to effectively maintain peace and stability and protect civilians. I consider it very important for the next Secretary General to build a constructive, productive and mutually beneficial relationship with the United Nations Security Council in line with the UN Charter. Joining forces is of major importance for the success of the whole organization. Now a few words about my priorities. Understanding the enormous responsibility and huge expectations, I welcome and appreciate the openness and transparency of the current selection process. 
It gives the candidates a great possibility to present themselves and their views. My priorities are simple, and they reflect my long-standing professional quest to strengthen the multilateral system with the UN at its center. A UN Secretary General is a person who advocates common good, a set of values and human dignity that all people want, regardless of where they come from. So let me reiterate what I said at this very forum a year and a half ago. I said, many think that most of the pressing international issues stem from a different notion of, notion of values. I don't really think that the core values of each and every one of us differ that much from region to region. Peace, security, stability, family, prosperity, well-being. How's that different in Beijing, Addis Ababa, Nairobi, Cairo, Dhaka, from what it is in Geneva, New York, Moscow, Lima or Brussels? It simply isn't. So this is my point of departure. First of all, I do not want to see people stripped of all these values. And therefore, no wonder that conflict prevention and mediation is my top priority. Because by preventing wars, we save human lives. And besides that, a dollar spent on prevention can save up to $10 on humanitarian assistance. I thus feel strongly that prevention must return to the four of the UN activities as a concerted action. A particular focus must be put on the pre-conflict phase, the phase of build-up of tensions and escalation, with the need to act before the conflict breaks out, and with the strengthened UN capacities, such as early warning, mediation, good offices. That's what I call and understand diplomacy. Peacekeeping operations should have clear, credible and achievable mandates but also faster deployment. They must be more effective, more responsive, and accountable with enhanced coordination with regional and international actors. Post-conflict arrangements must also include better coordination of regional and international actors, cultural awareness, and respect for local particularities. Security sector reform, our flagship Slovak initiative, not only at the UN, but also in the OSCE, is a key instrument here. The new Secretary General, among other things, also should renew focus on the field and enhance assessment and humanitarian capabilities of the UN field offices and, where appropriate, create regional offices of preventive diplomacy. Enhance the pool of local negotiators to respect the need of local ownership. Enhance the dialogue between the Sec Secretary General and the Security Council. Some conflicts have dangerous spillover potential, but are not large enough to attract immediate attention. And to team up with all actors, national, regional, international, governments, NGOs, private, public. Development is my second priority and my next concern, even though we did very well here last year. And I'm referring, obviously, to the Sustainable Development Goals agreements from Paris, Addis Ababa, Sendai, but also Istanbul a few months ago. The Sustainable Development Goals are the most promising, most comprehensive, and most ambitious pledge to change the world in 15 years. Our common key challenge now is to make sure it gets implemented early and thoroughly. We must ensure that every individual receives the full package of opportunities the SDGs offer leaving no one behind. Also, unprecedented surge in humanitarian needs calls for better resource mobilization, quicker response mechanism, and better coordination among all stakeholders. We thus need to adjust the institutional system accordingly, including monitoring and evaluation, making full use of available indicators. Additionally, it is essential to keep political momentum and help inject political impetus to implementation efforts, to put emphasis on national ownership and leadership, to work on strengthening the catalytic role of the United Nations in order to respond to the needs of the poorest and most vulnerable, but also middle-income countries. 
and to revitalize new global partnership by involving all relevant stakeholders, including the private sector and civil society. My priority number three, the United Nations must continue to be the leading advocate for human rights and international law. The role of the United Nations is to strive that every individual lives in peace, security and dignity in just and prosperous world. All individuals are equal and human rights are universal, but we must avoid politicizing. Respecting local sensitivities is a must to avoid unnecessary misunderstandings. Human rights violations are often the first indicators of instability. So whenever there is such a risk, we must act, and we must act resolutely. To systematically prevent abuse of human rights, we have to make sure that the United Nations takes up the initiative. It is essential to continue with the institutional consolidation of the UN human rights system. It must be mainstreamed across all UN activities and adequately resourced. Apart of other things, the Secretary General should prevent or mitigate the human rights violations through early and coordinated preventive action. Put in place coherent approach to address early warning signs of instability. And also to consider the possibility of enhancing the independence of the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Rule of law is also an essential element in building and preserving sustainable peace and thus it has to be strengthened. We need a comprehensive assessment of the UN rule of law processes and to explore how to, be, how to make the rule of law stronger throughout the UN system. And finally, let me mention the role of the Secretary General as the Chief Administrative Officer. None of our objectives can be achieved without a competent, functional and effective Secretariat. We must respond effectively to constantly evolving needs. It requires continuous adjustments, improvements and adaptation. It is imperative that there is no asymmetry between what the world needs and our ability to deliver. It is crucial to ensure full transparency and accountability of the UN staff, starting with the Secretary General. All position in the United Nations system must be based on just geographical and gender balance. Nonetheless, qualifications and competencies remain most important. Equal participation and full involvement of women at all decision-making levels must be a norm in the 21st century, across the whole UN system. We need more women in senior positions, at the headquarters, and also in the field. I would nominate a woman from the Global South as a Deputy Secretary General. And as a candidate with an agenda of preventive diplomacy at its core, I would appoint more women as special representatives and envoys. Sound management of financial resources, according to the principle of budgetary discipline, is equally important. Effective oversight and strong accountability come with it too. On all these issues, I want to lead by example. Professionalism and the highest ethical standards are my main guiding principles. I shall motivate and inspire, promote teamwork, communicate clearly and expect best possible results. I am not afraid of responsibility and full accountability, and I have played by rules and openly all my life. Ladies and gentlemen, my feeling is that the UN system has all that's needed. Institutions, norms and know-how. There are capacities, human resources, brains and hands. But maybe, maybe the system is not adequately set to be able to deal effectively with today's challenges. So it's time to identify how to do things better and how to use existing instruments and processes more efficiently. On top of that, we need our common sense, goodwill and the art of listening. Such combination will produce respect, encourage tolerance and lead to agreements. And this would be our investment in the new era of modern multilateralism perfectly fit for the 21st century. So I thank you for giving me this opportunity to make another case for peace here at the International Peace Institute. Thank you for your attention.
Uh, we're now going to go directly to question and answers. If you'd raise your hand, uh, I think I'm going to call on three at once, okay. and then so you can take notes there on what they say. Um, uh, in the back, gentleman in the green shirt, uh, next to him, uh, other gentleman, and a third, and here in the third row. Thank you very much for this opportunity, IPI and Mr. Lagjak. I'm Waldo, I'm sorry, from Latin American News Agency. Uh, we've seen a, a complex scenario for the Secretary General work. I'm talking about countries that pressure to, that don't, don't want to be part of some report other than uh, take decisions that affect directly some peacekeeping mission. So my question is, what are your plans to dealing with such a uh, complex scenario and to guarantee that your mandate will be independent for those pressures? Thank you very much. My name is Silvano Zuekesa from African Leadership Center. You spoke about the rule of law, and I'm interested in how you'll address the prevailing justice instruments like the International Criminal Court, which has had a love-hate relationship with the African countries, and how do you how will you encourage universal observance of rule of law, especially the violation by the P5 members who appear to be above the justice system? Thank you. We'll go to the third. I just want to say the gentleman who just asked that question is one of our Africa fellows here at IPI, uh, students and young diplomats who spend the month with us. Uh, I'm mentioning all this because they have to leave a little early, so I wanted you to know when you see six or seven stand up at once and leave, it's not because of something that somebody said. <laughs> they have to be somewhere early. Especially me. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I wanted you to know that for sure. Okay, uh, George. Uh, thank you, Warren. Uh, Mr. Lychak, you come from a George, country... George, introduce yourself, please. Oh, oh, sorry. George Baumgarten, uh, correspondent for Jewish newspapers in North America and for some East African and Pan-African and online publications. Uh, you come, uh, not quite uniquely, but interestingly, from a country that uh, is al almost, I'm hesitant to say, long since fully recovered, but recovered from uh, many years of domination within the Soviet orbit, and you come from a country that uniquely almost escaped from the Soviet orbit in the late 60s. There are those of us who remember you, Mr. Dubček. Uh, can you explain how you feel this quali uniquely qualifies you for the position you seek? And as a result of your experience, what particular uh, uh, qualifications and experience uh, uh, particular qualifications uh, do you think you can bring to the office? Okay, you want to take those three? Okay. Well, to, the first question was uh, basically related to an unfortunate uh, situation that should not happen. Uh, and for a situation like, like this uh, not happening in the future, uh, Several things are important. F first one is that our reports must be accurate. We must stand firmly behind every word in our f official information so that to make sure that we are able to defend them. And uh, yes, it's clear that's part of life that not everybody might be happy with what we are stating, but as long as we, are, we know that what, what, what is in our documents is true, we shall have no problems to defend uh, our our reports. That's one thing. Second, to, to be neutral, to play by the rules, to be transparent, and not to Im, Im use double standards in treating different countries. So then you can afford to be strict. Uh, and of course, never forget that the authority of the whole United Nations is at stake. So there must be no compromise with that. The question about the rule of law and in particular relevance to the reference to the International Criminal Court. First of all, I believe that the International Criminal Court is a useful institution, particularly uh, crucial um, uh, in the fight against impunity. Let us not forget that it's a complementary mechanism, complementary to the national institutions uh, that get involved when the country is unable or unwilling to set in motion it, its domestic system of, of uh, juridical institutions. 
Uh, so that's the point of departure. Uh, it was, uh, it did not come out of the blue, it was uh, the will of the member states to introduce such an organ. Having said that, however, we shall also acknowledge the fact that there are uh, questions coming particularly from the African countries who have their doubts about the impartiality uh, of, 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 of this court. We must not underestimate, let alone ignore these concerns. And uh, again, the best way how to deal with these issues is to speak about them openly and to see whether these claims are based or unbased. And when they are based, we have to accommodate them. I really believe that it would be in everyone's interest to uphold the authority of the, of the ICC because we simply need that organ, but we must remove really the, the doubts about, uh, about it not being completely neutral and unbased. P5 countries have their particular role and particular responsibility in the UN system. That's the fact of life. Uh, that should be respected but not abused. So no one should be put above the rules and certainly not about the rule of law, and I don't think this is the case. And uh, for me, being the permanent member of the Security Council means first and foremost the greater responsibility compared to the other members of the United Nations. And that this should be the guiding and the le leading principle of their activities. Uh, thank you for mentioning the history, the re recent history of my country. Alexander Dubček was a Slovak, even though the process he starts, started is called Prague Spring. Uh, but uh, I really believe that uh, during the relatively short period of time, because I still consider myself being relatively <laughs> modestly young person, uh, we have witnessed so many changes that uh, normally uh, take hundreds of years to happen. And uh, believe me, it's a great difference between reading about it in a, in a book or being part of it. And last 25, 26 years, uh, of my life and of my country's life. I mean, I've changed the country three times without moving out of the country. <laughs> First, the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic, then the Czech and Slovak Federal Republic, and finally the Slovak Republic. You, you, we saw yeah, the system falling apart like a house of cards, which pushed us into, again, a unique situation when young people were called in uh, to, be part, to, to build the new system. So I was sent as ambassador to Japan when I was 31 years old. It would not normally happen, and it would not happen today in, in Slovakia, but it was the year 1994, and uh, the uh, middle-aged generation disappeared because many of them were either compromised uh, from the cooperation with the communist intelligence services, or they did not trust the project of the newly created Slovakia, and they uh, decided to stay in Prague and continue their careers because it was the option. So uh, we have learned firsthand, we have b we've been part of this, and we have also uh, seen that not that the smooth proceedings that we demonstrated with our Czech partners and brothers are not granted. We never thought of any other way uh, other than negotiated way. But I was uh, posted as a young diplomat in Moscow when the Soviet Union disintegrated. Uh, it was peaceful, but I wouldn't call it well organized. And then I spent 12 years on, of my professional career in different positions in former Yugoslavia in the Balkans. And of course, that was the uh, completely different case of, of a very tragic way of disintegration of a state. So uh, we tried to deal with the, with the consequences of the problem. We try to transfer our experience of, since we, we've got the advantage of several years and the countries of former Yugoslavia are trying to follow in our footsteps to, to join the European Union. So we have lots of experience to transfer, again, something that we have, we have accumulated being part of the process and not learning fr uh, about it from the books. So therefore, I would say that the region of Central and Eastern Europe has a unique transformational experience. And uh, we have been part of processes that normally people in well-organized countries, I would say, uh, don't have to go through. And fortunately enough, and I'm, I'm smiling when I'm saying this, it's been a positive experience. My country 
is now one of the most dynamic economies in the European Union, member of the Schengen of the Eurozone, now being the president of the European Union. Many are coming to us asking for our know-how uh, because they want to learn from our experience and also from the mistakes we've made, and there were plenty. Uh, so, uh, therefore, uh, I, I do think that it gives us comparative advantage. Plus, you are not arrogant. You have, you have been through so many difficult situations, including when my country was rejected to be invited to join the European Union first because of the democratic deficits. So you are humble. You respect that in different cultures there are different priorities, different ways of dealing with issues. And uh, it helps you to listen. And I'm surprised how little listening there is around us. People like to talk, but they have problems to listen. So instead of engaging in a dialogue, we witness way too often exchange of monologues, which do not cross. Or I've seen many times like people trying to solve the problem with a, according to the model that used to work in a completely different part of the world. It never works. So this is, this is also something that we've learned firsthand, and I, I believe uh, it's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Laurenti here, and another Africa fellow. Great, third. Once again, we'll take three at once. Okay. And okay. Uh, thank you, Warren. Jeff Laurenti. I have a policy question to ask, but your thoughtful answer, Minister Lachuk, to uh, George Baumgarten's question begs a follow-up. Uh, which is to ask what significance should we, should the, the members of the United Nations looking for Secretary General attached to Slovakia's current position with regard to not wanting refugees from the war-torn Middle East, you know, does that matter? The policy question um, is, uh, uh, um, is this. Um, your experience in peace and security has been within the Balkans, within the disintegrating uh, communist bloc countries and states. Um, aside from Ukraine's fragility, most of the peace and security issues facing the world community now are in the Middle East uh, and in Africa. And I wonder what differences you see between the situations you have dealt with in Eastern Europe and those in Middle East and Africa, uh, the world community has to be attentive to, you have to be attentive to, uh, and what kind of differences are required in terms of the kinds of countries that you would be seeking peacekeeping personnel from than what we've gotten used to as no-go zones for, let's say, Western troops. Thank you, right here. Hello, I'm with the New York City Bar. I'm a member. My name is Anne Marie Carl. I work on international matters. And I'm very taken by your priorities as well as the SDGs. And it seems like the bottom line is SDG number 16, rule of law, access to justice, as well as funding the access to justice, is uh, the bottom line to your priorities as well as to uh, negotiations, uh, and everything else that you have on your agenda. What do you see as the, the main issues for uh, problems that have been in the past for rule of law and access to justice, and how would you address it? And thirdly, how would you fund the access to justice component of SDG 16? And then the third is our African fellow. My name is Emiola Oyefuga. I'm from the African Leadership Center. I was happy to hear your comment about uh, including more women to senior positions in the UN. Um, I was wondering what you will do about including more women in the formal peace processes, especially the ones you know, that go on um, in African countries. Thank you. OK. First, on the uh, issue of refugees, and uh, thank you for asking me this question, because uh, there is a lots of information and also plenty of misinformation about it. The first thing that uh, we need to understand is that the migration is not a seasonal crisis, but it's a rather a generational reality, a phenomena we have to learn to live with. Uh, and I'm glad that UN has taken the lead and is uh, 
in, in full swing preparing the summit on migration on 19th of September. And I really expect many questions to be answered and we, that we will be able to provide a, a credible uh, and achievable plan how to deal with this phenomenon. Europe was caught unprepared, not the first time, unfortunately, uh, because uh, we way too often tend to ignore the symptoms. That's why I put, put the focus on preventive diplomacy. That means let's not close our eyes to the uh, things we, we don't like, but they are coming. Uh, and uh, it, then the problem, the next problem, when it was impossible to ignore the huge uh, numbers of, of uh, migrants, refugees, coming to the European shores, was that uh, European institutions were dealing or trying to deal with the issue in a standard European, uh, that means bureaucratic way. Uh, migration is not a bureaucratic problem. Migration is a huge challenge that has political dimension, that has economic dimension, that has social dimension, that uh, has a cultural dimension, uh, that might have security dimension. So believing that you can deal with this huge challenge uh, in a purely bureaucratic way, uh, that means that you agree on a, on a permanent mechanism of uh, relocation of incoming migrants and believing that this is the solution to the problem is uh, least to say naive. And that was our position. We said this is not uh, solving the problem. Uh, also, without uh, asking the very important questions that is there an absorption capacity? Uh, is it a legitimate question? I think it is. And second, how these numbers that were uh, produced, uh, how these numbers guarantee the possibility of integration of these people into the European society? Because I really believe in that integration is the key. It makes a major difference whether I am uh, inviting someone to become, to become part of the economic system of my country or to become a part of the social network. So, and, uh, so we were advocating for a comprehensive approach from the very beginning. We said, let's start with the countries of origin and to see what the root causes are and let's address these root causes. Let's talk to the countries of transit. Uh, let's respect our own rules, uh, including uh, the returns of those who are misusing the current phenomena and do not uh, fall into the definition of of a refugee, a uh, number of aspects that need to be dealt with uh, in a complexity. Because what we saw as a, as a result of this uh, very partial approach was that then individual countries were taking individual measures. And of course, it was not to the, uh, to the benefit of, the, of, of Europe as such. Closing the borders, uh, growing nationalism, growing tensions among the European countries, phenomena that are, well, uh, unheard of for many years in Europe. So what we have been advocating for s from the very beginning was uh, that we need a comprehensive approach, and I'm glad that this is exactly the philosophy that the United Nations has undertaken, uh, and it pro it's projected in the preparation of the summit. Second. I'm going to ask you to answer the third question now, because the African fellows have to leave in a moment. OK. That was the question about women, and women in yes. the peace process. Well, it's easy. Uh, the women, <laughs> no, the women represent half of the population. So it's logical and normal that uh, they should be adequately represented in our activities. In the U UN system, you have only 34% of women uh, uh, in the system and only 22% of women in senior positions. So it's a waste of talent, waste of potential, waste of capacity. So uh, it, it projects the view of e as if there are jobs that are purely men. I don't believe there are purely men job, jobs. And also, out of 71 presidents of the General Assembly, only three were women. So it comes with the member states in the first place, because uh, uh, it's, it's easy and popular to advocate for more women, but then you propose men for the jobs. So let's uh, look uh, into what we can all do together to make sure that the best women apply for jobs, and uh, there are women in in, in different positions doing excellent job, so I really believe that uh, it's normal uh, to have them represented adequately also throughout the UN system. So that's, uh, that's how I, I look at it. And to co com complete uh, the answer, the second part of the problem that we have, we have uh, voiced is that uh, 
as I said in my presentation, there is no such thing as one size fits all. So there are different countries with different uh, history, different tradition of multiculturalism, and therefore this unified approach, this distribution, uh, has a different impact and different reaction. Slovakia, the countries of Central Europe, we know that we are a transit country. We are not the target country. Uh, the number of people who are applying for asylum in my country is very low, extremely low compared to Austria, now our neighbor. More than that, uh, three out of four people who, have, who were granted asylum in Slovakia are no longer in Slovakia anyway. They left for other countries. So that's what we are trying to do. Let's, instead of approaching this issue administratively, let's ask what each country can do to contribute to the common solution. <coughs> Financial contribution, personnel, uh, experience. We have a very unique uh, model that works uh, very well with uh, Austria, namely that we are hosting on our territory uh, refugees who are asking for uh, uh, asylum in Austria. And they stay for a month, we cover the expenses, and then uh, there has never been any accident, uh, very good discipline. Our people are getting used to the to the presence of of of, of migrants on our territory. Uh, we are helping uh, the Austrians, and uh, through this uh, model, we have hosted or accommodated a um, number of refu refugees, which is much higher than the number that was allocated to us according to that principle. So that's what we are saying: that uh, let's all contribute to the solution the best way uh, that suits each of our countries, and this, this will be sustainable and th this will work. So this is how we look at it. And more and more countries are understanding that this is, this is the right approach. Now, Middle East and Africa versus Eastern European countries. So each case is different. Uh, there, as I said, there, are, there is no mechanical trans transformation uh, of experience from one, one model to the other. It definitely helps you uh, when you have the first hand experience in, in a with the crisis situation in one part of the world, because then you, I would say, have enhanced sensitivity to deal with uh, other problems, other issues. It's always important how you approach the problem from the very beginning. So we need to seek for realistic solutions. Most of the problems that we are facing in the Middle East are protracted problems, so it's more difficult to, to deal with them now than it would have been from the beginning, but it's the reality. First priority should be to calm down the tensions and to stop killing of innocent civilians. That's absolute, that must be everyone's number one priority. And then to seek for political solution, because again, I'm a professional diplomat, I don't believe in any other than uh, diplomatic and political solution. Because even if we resort to a military solution, in the end, it is to be politicians and diplomats finding the way, ways how to settle the, the issue. So it's, uh, let's skip the military intermezzo, which is so tragic, uh, and, 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 and find for political solution. And again, it cannot be winners versus losers. We must be ready to compromise. We must understand that uh, in this difficult situation, everyone has to give in and to step back uh, in, in the interest of, of the common solution. So these are the guiding principles that, that I, would, I believe uh, we shall apply in dealing with these issues. And uh, uh, sustainable development goals in particular, I'm glad you mentioned the SDG number 16 because I really consider it particularly important and that's what makes the difference between the Millennium Goals and the current uh, sustainable development goals because here we have uh, tasks for every country, not only for the least developed or developing countries and uh, the goal number 16 is what I call good governance and you can hardly achieve uh, your other goals uh, if the country is not well governed, if there is no rule of law, if there is no justice, if uh, there is no normal functioning of institutions. So uh, therefore, we, we need to help investing into the good governance, into the functioning of institutions. And this also answers your other questions about the access to justice uh, and the right to, to, to have a fair treatment by the institutions. So it's uh, very ambitious. Actually, I don't know whether we are aware that we have pledged to change the world in 15 years. <laughs> 15 years is not a very long period of time, and we have no time to waste there. And therefore, uh, since U UN 
has shown leadership on this extremely ambitious agenda, uh, we must keep the momentum, and that's I, what I also mentioned in my... The momentum is here, and we must start implementing from the day one. We have to ha have a set of indicators to monitor how well or not so well we are doing, to be able to react, to talk to the governments that are lagging behind, to help them if, in case they need help. And the system of institutions and the UN uh, agencies must be adjusted so that we uh, have the patronage over each of the 17 goals and that we have the full monitoring of the system. So uh, if, if we uh, succeed in this, then we have succeeded in, 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 in changing, the, changing the world for better, including the access to, to justice and, and, uh, and access, access to justice for everyone. Good. Um, I'll take some more. Um, I have in the back a colleague who has been following this on Facebook, and she will have a question for us from uh, some exotic place far away, I hope. Uh, do we have any other questions of people uh, in the room? Well, Valencia, go ahead and tell us what you're hearing from outside. Um, so I have three questions, if that's okay. Excellent. So the first question that has been asked by many of our Facebook, Facebook viewers um, is about the recent violence in Kashmir, where protesters have been injured. So they ask, what is the role of the UNSG in encouraging peace in these regions where there's violence between people and governments? And um, the next was asked by Sarah and Sienna on Twitter. And they both want to know how you would address the cholera outbreak in Haiti. And the last is a question from Facebook users about paid internships at the UN. About what, sorry? Paid, paid internships at the UN. Paid inter um, so they're wondering if you would support a policy change with the UN system regarding unpaid internships so youth, um, especially underserved youth, can serve as interns at the UN. Thanks. If anyone had any doubts that young people follow Facebook, I should tell you every single candidate here has been asked a question via Facebook about internships yes. at the United Nations. Uh, so, Kashmir? Well, first, it's the responsibility of the governments to protect its citizens and protect civilians. The international community and the UN in particular has the responsibility to protect if the governments fail uh, and in accordance with the UN Charter and uh, in the ideal case upon the decision of the UN Security Council. So, uh, and you know that uh, if uh, the cases of uh, mass violence happen, then uh, we have the institutions to deal with it. The Security Council should uh, speak about it and uh, agree on the steps to be undertaken. And the uh, sec Secretary General, because you asked specifically about the role of the Secretary General, uh, has his role, the political role, according to the Article 99 of the Charter, that he can bring to the attention of the Security Council any matter that, in his view, uh, threatens the maintenance of international peace and security. So we, have the, we, ha we clearly know what's, uh, what's the uh, proce proceedings of steps, what's the responsibility. And as I said, the, the it's resp responsibility begins with the government. Cholera uh, in Haiti. Cholera in Haiti is a very tragic and unfortunate case uh, that should never happen, but it did happen. So uh, what needs to be done? First, to stop uh, the spreading of the disease, of the epidemic. And to, second, to treat all those who uh, have suffered. For this, we need uh, financial resources. So we need uh, to generate these financial resources. And uh, what I've seen uh, is the amount of 2.2 billion US dollars, which is huge. So this is, this is the first priority, really, to <coughs> prevent this disease from spreading further and to help with the medical treatment of those who have been infected. And as the Secretary General uh, said that he's ready to talk further, uh, we, uh, and I think we should. Uh, there, are, there have to be lessons learned, and there are many questions that we need to ask ourselves because 
The fact is that uh, uh, the contingents come from member states, but they serve under the UN flag. So where is the responsibility? Where, where starts and where ends the responsibility of the member states versus the United Nations? But the fact is that the damage was done to the image of the United Nations in, in, the, in, in, the, in a very bad way. So uh, we need to uh, give maximum attention to the, to the case, and the people in Haiti must feel that we care, that we are sorry, and that we are doing everything to remedy the situation now. And then and paid and internship. unpaid internships. <laughs> Well, uh, that's, um, I, I, I think I know the system quite well, but I don't know every detail of the UN system. I know that there is a program, there is a policy for internships, but uh, I, if you ask me what, what is the particular problem here, I must admit I, I, I cannot answer here, but I think that the, the merit of the internship is to, to have the chance to work in the system. It's not about being paid because you can get paid elsewhere. But uh, I have a very advanced program of internship in my foreign ministry. We uh, receive hundreds of young people every year. They, and they are not paid, but they are happy to be part of the system because they learn and we, als we also uh, learn who they are and whether they can be our future colleagues. So, uh, uh, so that's probably the best of my answers to this question. Do I have any more questions on the floor? Here in the third row. And Okay. Hi, um, my name is Michelle Crutch. I'm a student at Columbia University and one of the unpaid interns at the Department of <laughs> Political Affairs. And do you complain? Um, my question is not necessarily about internships, but um, we're told again and again that entering the UN system is close to impossible. It's very difficult. It's very competitive. Um, particularly as a young woman, how do you see um, increasing the accessibility of the UN for young youth, particularly females? Yeah, so now I think that probably the best answer to your questions about the internship should have been elect me and I'll look into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> UN for young, uh, it's a very important question because half of the world's population are people am below 25 years of age and in a number of countries this, this share is more than 60%. I mean, if uh, with what we do we cannot attract the young people, then all we do is good for nothing. Young people are future leaders of our countries and of this planet and therefore to bring the UN closer to young people. It sounds like cliche, uh, I know, because it, it was said so many times. Uh, and it's not only the problem of the United Nations. I'm, as the current president of the European Union, that's exactly the headache we are trying to solve uh, on the EU side, that people stopped understanding what we do. And if you don't understand, you cannot support. So the same uh, goes for the, for the UN system. How to make it more attractive? First, to, to bring young people through internship. I think it's... Uh, it's a win-win scenario because, uh, yes, uh, you learn something, but you also understand how the system works. You bring in fresh ideas and you communicate after finishing your internship with, within your uh, environment about what you have seen, what you have learned. And also all the systems that remain close uh, lose contact with the you know, with the external world with, and with reality. And therefore, internship is one of the excellent ways how to have the day-to-day -day reality check. Uh, second, communicate with young people the way young people are used to communicate among themselves. Be on social media, be modern, be attractive, regardless of the fact that what UN does is very serious. But also the very serious stuff can be communicated in a way that is e easy to digest and understand. Engage with young people, contact young people uh, through the outreach activities of the Secretary General of, of the UN agencies and offices. So. Uh, what I am really afraid of uh, would be the feeling that uh, young people live their own lives and UN lives its own life. And these two, li two, two lives or two, two worlds do not uh, connect. That would be very bad. So uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge, not only for, for the United Nations, for, but for a number of institutions, as I said. And uh, you have to feel part of the process. You have to feel par par involved in the policies, and especially the policies that uh, well, that have impact on, on you. So uh, 
that's the that that's what we need to do, and we need to do much more actively. I have a question in the front row. It's Mikiko Sawanishi, a UN Democracy Fund. I just want to know you as a person. Uh, tell us about you, as uh, really your family, uh, your hobby, the worst and best experiences. I just want to know you as a person. So, uh, I'm a funny person because I always wanted to be a diplomat since I was 10 years old. All my friends from that time remember that I, I was dreaming about becoming a diplomat, and I did become a diplomat. I did all it took to study in international relations, and I've, uh, I've enjoyed this profession, and I still do. And I'm very grateful for everything that uh, I was able to see and to do, uh, thanks to uh, diplomacy. So I have a happy coincidence of uh, the profession and the hobby, because my profession is my hobby, which makes me a sort of a crazy person, because some people call it workaholism, but it's simply enjoying what you do. That's one thing. Second, you need to have a very, very tolerant family for that. And uh, if uh, they say that behind every su successful man, there is a, a highly efficient uh, woman and tolerant and lovable, that's exactly my case. So we, my, my wife is a, a well-known personality in uh, Slovakia. She is a TV anchor, mm. TV news. Actually, uh, she used to, be, some years back, she was much more popular than I when I was an <laughs> ordinary ambassador. I was known in, uh, in the society as, as her husband. You know, now it has a bit cha of changed, but uh, uh, she, uh, she, she won a number of uh, uh, viewers awards for the most popular TV personality. Uh, we have three daughters, so that's why I am uh, female enough, and I have the full understanding of the potential of women. Uh, so two of them live their independent lives already, and the youngest one is 13, so she's with us. My uh, hobbies, provided I have time for hobbies, but if I should judge by the amount of time I give to my activities, then I would say that my number one hobby is reading the emails, because that's what I do all the time, <laughs> 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 which does not mean I enjoy it. Uh, I love sports. And you have to do sports to be able to survive uh, in these hectic lives. So jogging, roller skating, tennis, uh, and uh, uh, mountaineering. That's uh, what, I, what I love very much. Reading, uh, again, reading something else than, than the emails. And spending time with the, with the family and friends. It's so rare, so I, I really get to appreciate that, because uh, I really believe that Probably two most important things uh, at certain moment of your lives are health and uh, and the relationships with people you you like uh, and they like you and you feel relaxed. Hmm. So that's what I and s probably the second principle is uh, uh, I believe in teamwork. I I try to motivate people uh, by first by being an example and also by keeping them positively motivated. I believe in positive motivation. So people must be looking forward to what they do, and they must. I, it's also important to have a very a positive environment, even th in the workplace, even if you deal with uh, difficult issues. Because if there are tensions, if people don't talk to each other, then there is no way you can move things forward. Mr. Lachak, I must. Say, I have to remain totally impartial in this contest, but I confess, when I read in your biography that you were married to a journalist, I had a slight favorability <laughs> in your direction, so I'm glad that came out. Um, uh, Mr. Lachok is the eighth candidate uh, who has spoken here in this commitment we have to put all candidates on stage. There are now 12 of them. Uh, on July 26th, uh, which at 8.30 in the morning, we will have Susanna Malcora. She will be the ninth candidate. And I think in a day or two, we'll have a couple of other people lined up so we're hoping to get everybody here by the end of July. And in that connection, I wanted to thank you very much for coming here. The other night, as you all know, there was a debate in the General Assembly. Mr. Lajak could not be there because of his responsibilities as president of the European Council, but he was there on, uh, on video. 
and I was hoping that you would manage to make it here 36 hours later. Thank you for doing that, and thank you very much for your forthrightness and, and for your good questions and your good answers to their good questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.